Hello. Um, so you, you might be wondering how a clothing historian uh, got to be talking to you about condoms. Uh, and it is a story. So <laughs> a couple of years ago, and as uh, Daisy mentioned, I, I worked for the National Trust for Scotland. Uh, we were looking at renovating Gladstone's land, uh, completely redoing the visitor experience there. And uh, we had a psychic come round, just as a, not, not as part of those discussions. Uh, and she, she toured the property. And we often get ghost hunters and psychics and things like that in. Uh, and she, she went round the property and she got down to our cellar, to our basement, and she said, sex workers were here. And we said, okay, okay Linda. And, um, and she was like, no, no. Uh, and one of our volunteers who'd been present did not let this drop. She brought it up at every inopportune moment for weeks afterwards. And eventually I said, okay, okay, we'll have a look into this. We'll see if actually there was a boardy house or a brothel in the property. And this led me into this incredible dive into the history of sex in Edinburgh, uh, which resulted in us running a tour at Gladstone's Land called It Lives, which looks at exactly that. Um, but it particularly took me to the history of condoms. And um, being a clothing historian, uh, you can probably see some parallels here, um, particularly when I got into fabric condoms, um, which we are definitely going to talk about this evening. Uh, so this is my new niche subject, is linen condoms. Uh, and I, I did not think I would be here either, but here we are. Uh, so uh, we are going to do a very sort of general overview tonight, and it is the first time I've done this sort of whole history of condoms, so you're getting, getting a preview of this lecture. Uh, so we'll see how it goes. Feedback welcome. Um, so uh, when I've come to research sex history, uh, one of the things that I found is that there is an enormous amount of misinformation on the internet. Um, and that's probably not a surprise to anybody. Uh, but I have found it nowhere more than with condoms. It is amazing the nonsense you will find um, about the history of condoms. And I just wanted to start with this, uh, which is a prime example of that. Now, I've really struggled to track down exactly what this is a photo of. Um, but if you do a reverse image search, if you look this up online, it will tell you repeatedly that this is the world's earliest condom. Um, it's not. It's a penis sheath made of leather. Um, it's from ancient Egypt. It's probably from Tutankhamun's tomb, um, but I'm really struggling to actually tie that with the inventory. Um, and they were widely worn in ancient Egypt as a piece of clothing. Um, and just because you're putting something on your penis does not mean it's a condom. Uh, and, and that seems to be an issue that crops up a lot when you start talking about the history of condoms. Um, so what we do know is that um, although you know there is all of these things out there saying the ancient Egyptians had condoms, uh, the Romans had condoms, um, we have absolutely no evidence to support that. Um, and actually, we have a whole series of medical texts from the ancient world which talk about contraception and do not mention condoms. Um, there we've got um, all sorts of recipes for um, potions um, and all sorts of things that women are told to do um, after sex to prevent themselves getting pregnant. Um, exercise, uh, drinking cold water and things like sneezing as well. Uh, and I feel that if the medical texts have in place um, all of these suggestions for preventing pregnancy, um, and it is pregnancy they tend to be focused on, um, if they were using condoms, there, it is likely that they would have also been mentioned in those same sections, although it's not to say. We, just, we simply do not have any evidence. The first evidence we have of condom usage comes from this gentleman, um, Fallopio. Uh, now, these are his dates, so he's 16th century, and he was an Italian um, anatomist. Now, he is, as you might have guessed from his surname, known for his work on the fallopian tubes. Um, and he is also known for his work um, to try and prevent the spread of syphilis. He also, on a side note, and we will have a couple of side notes tonight, uh, he was one of two male anatomists uh, in the 16th century in Italy who claimed to discover the clitoris. Now, he, he was um, 
the first sort of documented outbreak of syphilis that we have um, is from 1495 um, amongst French troops that were besieging Naples. Uh, and it then spread from there. And he, um, Fallopio, spent quite a lot of time trying to, to prevent its spread. Uh, and he actually wrote a book um, which was published two years after his death, so in 1564, um, which roughly translates as the complete book of the French disease. Um, and because uh, syphilis was seen as originating with sort of French troops, it was known in some countries as the French disease. Uh, now, in that, he suggests using a linen sheath um, to prevent, um, whilst having sex, um, to prevent the spread. Now, there is some confusion about actually how you interpret this quote. Um, but this is, this is the general um, translation. It was written in Latin, um, and this is the, the one that you see most often. As often as a man has intercourse, he should, if convenience permits, wash his genitals or wipe them with a cloth. Afterwards, he should use a small linen cloth made to fit over the glands. It would be as well to moisten with saliva. Now, depends who you talk to about how you interpret this. Uh, my reading of it is that he is suggesting that you, are put, that you should put the linen cloth on to have sex. He's saying that you're putting it on after you've washed your genitals. Uh, and the fact that he's suggesting you moisten it with saliva is for some form of lubrication. Um, but there are readings of this um, that you've got in sort of various popular sex history books that have been published recently that sort of takes the mick out of him gently for suggesting that actually that cloth is put on after sex. Um, it's really hard to tell from this translation which it is. Um, but, but my feeling is that he's suggesting you wear it during sex. What I really need is like a 16th century Latin specialist to go back to the original text and have a look for me. So if there are any volunteers here, just give me a wave. Uh, but this is the first reference that we have to some sort of, um, to basically a use of a condom. And it is very focused on uh, preventing the spread of venereal disease at this point. Um, we get a similar uh, a similar reference by this man a few years later, um, Sir Hercules of Saxonia. Um, he is also an Italian physician, uh, and he mentions uh, using a linen sheath in a very similar manner. Um, just a few years later, in 1597, um, in his book on venereal disease, uh, and he suggests that this linen sheath should be worn during sex, um, and again, that sort of suggests that that's also what uh, Fallopio was suggesting in his text. Um, uh, but he also suggests treating it with an unspecified medicinal solution, letting it dry and then using it. But he doesn't actually say what's in that solution. Um, I assume they believed it was some sort of um, the spermicide or something like that, but we, we just don't have any information on what that was. Now, were people actually using these fabric condoms? We've got two medical texts that talk about them, but were they actually being used in, in real life? And, and were they being used to prevent venereal disease or were they being used to prevent pregnancy? Well, our first popular history reference comes from this. Now, this is a porn novel, and it is a fascinating porn novel. Uh, it was published in French in 1655, um, and it takes the form of a conversation between two women. One of them is quite sexually experienced, the other is not, and she basically persuades her less sexually experienced cousin. tells her all about it in absolutely graphic detail. Uh, now, it was, uh, <laughs> it was both a success and a failure. It was a success in that people wanted to read it in France in 1655, um, but it was a failure in the fact that the government were not impressed and burnt most of the original copies. Uh, so it was republished illegally uh, in various other places in the following years and was ultimately translated into English in 1680. Now, this fabulous picture is from the 1680 uh, English um, publication, uh, and this is the, the front page. Uh, and yeah, you can translate it as sort of the School of Venus. Uh, interestingly, if anyone's read the diaries of Samuel Pepys, uh, he also uh, reads this in its original French and then uh, says it's a horrid book and burns it, essentially because he doesn't want to be discovered with a copy of it. Um, I mean, given the things that Samuel Pepys gets up to, that's fairly low down the list. Uh, but um, this has a mention of a condom in it. Well, or something similar. 
Uh, so Susanna, one of the, one of the cousins, um, talks about preventing pregnancy. Um, and she suggests that women can protect themselves from pregnancy by putting a little linen cloth on the head of the prick and letting it unload because the cloth receives the liquor of love. So there we've got one fabric condom being used in practice. So what happens in the 17th century is that we go from having these sort of sporadic mentions of fabric condoms to actually having increasingly regular mentions of a different kind of condom. Um, and those are made from animal gut. Uh, and the first sort of, the first actual, like, provable reference we have to these comes with these, uh, which are the Dudley Castle condoms. Uh, now, these animal gut condoms were made in a very similar fashion, as far as we're aware, to the fabric ones. They were essentially a tube, um, and uh, they supersede the fabric condoms in the 70, end of the 17th century and become wildly popular in the 18th century amongst the sort of the middle and upper classes, the people who can afford them. Um, so, starting with the Dudley Castle condoms, these are absolutely fascinating. Uh, these, essentially, uh, they were dug up in the 1980s, and we can date them really, really precisely. Um, so, Dudley Castle is in the West Midlands, uh, and in the, the keep is 13th century, um, and it has some latrines in the keep, long drop sort of garderobes, uh, and they were used when the keep was first, uh, first in play in the 13th century, and then they were closed up. And they weren't reopened until 1642, and we know that because we have a record of that. Um, and they were opened up for royalist forces who held the castle from 1642 until 1646. Um, and they lived in the keep and they used the latrines. Uh, in 1647, the castle's defences were demolished, shutting in the latrines. So we know that everything they found in those latrines dates between 1642 and 1647, which is an incredible piece of sort of social history right there. And in the 1980s, they dug up, they excavated the latrines. And in the process of that, they found 10 animal gut condoms. These are five of them. These are the five that they think were used. Obviously, they're, frag they're fragments of the originals. Um, they also found a further five that were tucked inside each other, and they think probably for storage, and they think those ones hadn't been used, um, and these ones had. But they're not entirely sure. Uh, it's all guesswork. Now, it's quite hard, given the conditions that these have been kept in, to account for things like shrinkage in the size of these. Um, but based on later condoms that we have, animal gut condoms, um, we think these were shorter than the ones that became standard later and were actually just designed to cover the tip of the penis and not the full penis. Now, uh, one thing we can take from these is that actually they're pretty standard in terms of their thickness and in terms of their sizes. Um, and this does suggest that even by the 1640s, there is um, a level of professionalism in the manufacture of animal gut condoms. Um, so there is clearly, A, they're clearly superseding the fabric, and, and B, that they are being produced in um, by in some sort of manufacturing process. This isn't just a cottage industry that's happening. Now, from this point onwards, animal gut condoms pop up in literature left, right, and center. And as you can imagine, there's a lot of satirical literature that they appear in, but they also start appearing in other things as well. Uh, and uh, they've become a real sort of popular, popular culture. Um, but we also increasingly from this point on get surviving examples, which is brilliant because we have no surviving examples of fabric condoms, which I find very sad. Um, and I actually went to, and I forgot it tonight, so you'll have to come to one of the sex tours at Gladstone's Land. We actually have a replica fabric condom that we made with sort of guesswork um, around some of these. Um, but these are the sort, of, the sort of references that you get to your animal gut condoms. Um, and when I say animal gut, um, they did actually test the Dudley Castle ones. They don't know what they were made out of. Um, but it does seem that they were made from pig's intestines, from lamb skin, which is basically lamb's intestines, um, and also occasionally from fish skin. Um, but that was, seems to have been less common. 
Um, so this is from a poem by William Patterson that was published in 1727, and it's all about it's all about condoms. Uh, and he describes he describes these gut condoms as dirty yellow and bound with blue. Now the bound with blue is a ribbon that was sewn round the bottom of the condoms to hold them in place. Uh, and then he goes on to say that these were ordains it shall all sizes fit, providing that it first be wet. So this is to do with the usage of these animal guts. Um, so the way that they were processed, and we'll talk more about this later, um, is that they were essentially dried out to preserve them for longer. And so when you came to use one, you had to pop it in some water or some milk, again, as we'll find out about later, uh, and rehydrate it before you pop it on. Um, and then you would hold it in place with a bit of ribbon that was round the bottom. Uh, but then, and then when it put off to the end of time, so when you're done, should smell of fish and feel of slime. So that tells you a little bit about what it was like to use them. Now, we are going to take a tangent into Eric Dingwall because sometimes when you start researching sex history, uh, you, you know it's going to be weird. Uh, and then you find someone like Eric Dingwall and he just exceeds all of your expectations. So he is worth a tangent because it is through him that we have our next oldest condom. Uh, and these come in their original wrappers. Uh, so this man, this is a fabulous picture of him from the 1920s. He is uh, known, known to his peers as Dirty Ding. He was, he was a collector, he was a librarian, uh, but most prominently initially, he was a psychic researcher. Uh, and in the 1920s and 30s, he uh, goes out and he spends a lot of time trying to disprove mediums. Uh, and then in the Second World War, we don't quite know what he was doing. Uh, he was doing something top secret for the government, uh, supposedly at Bletchley Park. Nobody knows. But after the Second World War, he joins the British Library and he becomes responsible for the private case. Now, the private case in the British Library is where all of the naughty things were kept uh, that weren't allowed to be on public display. Uh, and he actually contributed. He was of private means uh, and he actually contributed a number of items to it, including a series of German books on flagellation and a, uh, an original copy of John Clayland's Fanny Hill, uh, which is sort of the first porn novel. Uh, and he uh, really started to become an expert on the history of sex. Obviously, he kept his interest in magic and the paranormal, but he really developed sort of a knowledge around um, erotica and around the history of sex. And he wrote a series of books. His books have the most amazing titles. Uh, so The Girdle of Chastity, that was one of his early, uh, early books on the history of the chastity belt. And it is due to Eric Dingwell that we have this misplaced idea that medieval people were wearing chastity belts left, right and centre. Um, the Unknown, Is It Nearer? And Very Peculiar People, both about mediums. And of course, not forgetting how to use a large library. Now, he, uh, he becomes such an expert in sex history that actually Scotland Yard start to uh, ask him to consult on cases that have a sort of sexual peculiarities involved. And he actually ends up consulting on the Profumo affair. So an absolutely fascinating man. But due to him, we have these. Now, these date, uh, these are the sort of the next incarnation of animal gut condoms. So you saw those tips from Dudley Castle. These are quite a lot later. They're around 1790. Uh, and you can see that they're a lot longer. And you can see that ribbon that I talked about very clearly there. In this case, it's pink. Um, and they're also the oldest that came in their original packaging. Uh, now, he found these in the 90, early 1950s at a, an unspecified country house. This is what he says in a 1953 paper. During a recent examination of the contents of a muniment room in a large English country mansion, um, I really want to know which one, a locked box was discovered, which on being open was found to contain a number of sheaths of an early type. They were in packets of eight of three different sizes, and the inner white and outer blue wrappers were apparently those in which they'd been delivered. Uh, so here we are, and those are the wrappers. Uh, now, these, are, these ones are in the British Museum. Um, he also dropped off examples at the Royal College of Surgeons in London and the Kinsey Institute. He went out to America to visit Kinsey and took him a, took him a 1790s animal gut condom with him. Um, so there's one over there too. Um, so these give us a much clearer idea of sort of actually what these looked like. And obviously this is in its dehydrated form. Uh, and 
Here's another one. Um, and from the early 1800s, we start to get quite a lot. Um, this one is in Lund. Um, and this is back where you come to all of this misinformation on the internet. So you will find this picture repeatedly attached to the assertion that this is from the mid 1600s. And it's because somebody got confused with a press release that went out a couple of years ago from an exhibition, which also had the Dudley Castle condoms in it. Um, and it's just been repeated again and again. This is actually from 1813. Um, but it comes with a note in Latin, which tells you how to use it, which includes uh, the suggestion that it is dipped in warm milk before use, so not water, to avoid diseases when sleeping with prostitutes. Um, so uh, that is the first suggestion that we found us out of, about milk and using milk to rehydrate it. Um, and people are still rediscovering these things. Um, just last year, um, somebody discovered some that they think are probably from the 1820s in the Bodleian in Oxford, uh, from the wallet of the Earl of Clarendon. Um, and they were just going through the collection and boom, several animal, animal gut condoms. Now, I've been referring to these as condoms. Um, in the 18th century, um, they weren't always called condoms. Um, they were called all sorts of things, and that makes researching this quite tricky. Uh, but you'll be delighted to discover that actually the first verified use of the word condom um, is a Scottish reference. And uh, this is from this poem, which was written in 1706. Now, this comes from a broadside, and this is obviously the lead up to the Acts of Union. Uh, and there is a series of poems published that are pro and anti-union. Um, and, and these are printed on broadsides in Edinburgh and they get very competitive. Um, and this is an answer to the initial pro-union one. This one is anti-union. Um, it's attributed to John Hamilton Belhaven. Um, and actually the, the verse itself um, needs a bit of explanation. So the turncoat, the outfield turncoat that mentioned here uh, is John Campbell, the second Duke of Argyll. Now he was an Englishman and he was sent up to Scotland with, to, to take on a role here. And um, in the press of the time, it was alleged that he brought condoms with him and introduced them to Scotland. Scotland. And it was a lot of sort of um, satirising that was going on. I mean, he, I'm certain there were condoms in Scotland before 1705. Um, but this is sort of the, the, the suggestions that appear in, in the press at the time. Uh, and so this is poking fun at him. When reasonings answered by seconded votes and speeches are bantered by outfield turncoats, then syringe and condom both come in request while virtuous quandam is treated in jest. So basically he's saying this, this turncoat, this man who's up here, he is, he, you know, I'm taking the mitt because he's brought condoms with him, but also uh, through the act of union, you will uh, bring up all of the uh, nasty sexual practices that are going on in England and you will allow them into Scotland. Um, and actually uh, what you're doing is the, the quandam, the, the status quo is much better, but you're laughing at it. Uh, so, he really is sort of, he's going, going quite hard for this, but this is, this is the first verified use of the word condom. Uh, instead of that, um, this is what you see um, in a lot of 18th century texts, instead of the, the word condom, um, sheath, armor, and machine are the ones you see most commonly. Uh, glove, English raincoat, you get that a lot in France, uh, and French letters crops up a lot as well. And there are other words, of course, as well, um, but these are the ones that I've seen most often while looking into this. Um, and of course, you know, this is a real problem in sex history. There are so many words for condoms. There are so many words for penises. There are so many um, regional words, colloquialisms, that if you're trying to search terms, it's really tricky. Now, in the 18th century, um, these sort of condoms become incredibly widespread. Uh, and we know that because they start cropping up in diaries. They, they've moved out of just the satirical press. I mean, they stay there, but, but they move into the commonplace. They move into um, just, just accounts of what people are doing. Um, and they crop up again and again in the diaries of James Boswell. Uh, now, he... Um, wrote extensively about his sort of sexual liaisons with all sorts of people. And this is, I mean, this is just a, an example, but he regularly writes about how sort of pro the use of condoms he is um, and how he, uh, he sort of expects to use them in his sexual liaisons. 
Uh, and this sort of shows him not having sex because he doesn't have a condom. Um, and he's doing this because he is really scared of venereal disease. I mean, he gets it several times, um, but he, he is, he's very concerned and that's why he's pro-condom. I picked up a girl in the Strand, went into a court with the intention to enjoy her in armour. So a good euphemism there. Um, but she had none. I toyed with her. She wondered at my size and said if I ever took a girl's maidenhead, I would make her squeak. I gave her a shilling and had command enough of myself to go without touching her. I afterwards trembled at the danger I had escaped. Uh, and he's not the only one. That's, in his, that's 1762. Casanova used them a lot later in his memoirs. Um, so those are his dates there. Um, again, this is just one example. So this is from volume three. Uh, and he is in a situation where he is with three young women and a government official. Whilst our caresses became more lively and ardent, the syndic, like a careful man, drew a packet of fine French letters from his pocket and delivered a long eulogium on this admirable preservative from an accident which might give rise to a terrible and fruitless repentance. The ladies knew them and seemed to have no objection to the precaution. They laughed heartily to see the shape these articles took when they were blown out. So he's blowing up condoms. He's blowing up condoms because that's how you checked. There were no holes in them before you used them. Uh, and this is an amazing picture from a later edition. This is from 1872, so well after that was written. Um, but this is how the illustrator of the, the late 19th century decided to portray that inc incident. And I thought it was too good to miss. Uh, so yes, you, you, you would do that to check. Um, but the fact that he's writing... In the 18th century, he's saying the women that we've encountered, they already knew what these were, they had no concerns about them, um, and that this was just something, this was an understood part of having sex um, in certain circles. He writes about them a lot. There's a whole incident where he steals a whole load from his uh, lover, who's a nun, MM, um, and then is forced to give them back. So there's quite a lot of sort of condom stories in there. Um, and not only that, they're not only appearing in diaries, they start appearing in art as well. Uh, now, you'll have to look quite closely for this, uh, but this is a self-portrait by Zoffany from uh, 1779. Um, now, there's a lot going on in this picture. He's making a lot of moral comment. But if you look very carefully at the back here, there's a couple of condoms hanging up. Uh, now, he is getting dressed to go to a fancy dress party. He's putting on his monk's robe, um, and he's almost certainly making some sort of comment about the debauchery of fancy dress and the pleasure gardens, the fact he's dressed as a monk or a, a friar, um, and maybe some comment on religion there. But um, So there is something definitely satirical going on here, but the fact that he's painting them in the back of his portrait um, suggests that they are fairly, fairly acceptable and fa a fairly well-known reference by this point. So how are these, I've mentioned sort of vaguely right back in the 17th century that there is clearly some mass production going on um, and that certainly by the 18th century, their use is really quite widespread. But how are they actually being made? Well, uh, this, uh, from the early 1800s, a number of sort of do-it-at-home recipes appear um, in receipt books and recipe books. Um, often stuck in there among like food and medicinal remedies and things like that. Uh, this one's from a little bit later. This is from 1844 from the United States Practical Receipt Book. So basically, you take your intestines, your sheep intestines, you soak it in water, turn it both sides, then repeat the operation in a weak lye of soda, so an alkaline solution, which must be changed every four or five hours. You then remove the mucous membrane with the nail. That was the, there was a list of things that you needed. One of them was a nail. Um, so basically a blunt object of some sort. Um, and that's essentially you are using the alkaline and the blunt object to remove that membrane because that is what makes it rot. Um, and you want it as dry and as crispy as possible to maintain it as long as possible. Sulfur it, um, wash it in clean water and then in soap and water, rinse, inflate to check there's no holes and dry. Um, and they were dried on appropriately shaped moulds. Um, and we do have a few of those moulds surviving in various places. Um, next, cut it to the required length and attach a piece of ribbon on the open end. Uh, so as you can see, that's quite a time-consuming process and quite a skilled process, actually. Uh, and so who was it? Who was it that was making these? Well, 
mostly women, it seems, certainly in London. Uh, and we know that because in the 18th century, Mrs. Phillips and Mrs. Perkins, the two largest manufacturers and sellers of condoms, um, engage in a vicious advertising war. Um, and they produce all sorts of handbills and advertising pamphlets where they talk about their products, they talk about the fact that they're making them, where they're selling them, where you can go to purchase them direct or what spaces they're sending them out to, um, and they get a bit competitive as well. Uh, so this one is from 1775, and it is uh, Mrs Phillips advertising, who was probably the most famous of the two. And um, I've picked out a few quotes from it that just give a sense of sort of the scale and what she's doing. Um, so it is well known to the public she has had 30 years experience in the above business of making and selling machines. So she's very clear that she's both manufacturing them and selling them. She defies anyone to equal her goods in England or any other country whatsoever. She having lately had several large orders from France, Spain, Portugal, Italy. So she is distributing. She's not just distributing in London. And I mean, obviously, she's bragging, but there's got to be some sort of um, there's got to be a sense of her levels of distribution here um, that she's exporting. Um, and then she goes on to say that she likewise has great choice of skins and bladders, that apothecaries, chemists, druggists, etc., may be supplied with any quantity and of the best sort. So she's exporting, um, she's manufacturing it in-house, um, and she's also wholesaling. So you can go direct to her, and she tells you at the beginning of the leaflet what her address is and how you can how she has a discreet entrance to, uh, to go and pick them up. Initially, she sells them at the sign of the green canister, and there's all sorts of satirical works about tea and condoms because of that. And then later in her career, sort of this 30-year career that she has, um, she starts selling them at the sign of the golden fan. And um, she, she becomes, she's so well known and this is such a big and sort of um, dominant business that actually she doesn't just drop, crop up in satirical um, literature, she starts cropping up in satirical prints. Uh, and this is a Gilray um, from, let me get the date right, um, 1786. Uh, it's called... Um, a sale of English beauties in the East Indies. And again, this ties into export. Uh, and essentially what it's showing is it's showing a series of sex workers getting off a boat in the East Indies and being surveyed by people who live there. Um, and they're being auctioned off by this very sort of tall, thin auctioneer character um, to the left of the picture here. Now, the box that he is uh, standing on here uh, actually is uh, labelled Mrs. Phillips, the original inventor Lester Fields. So they're suggesting that Mrs. Phillips invented the condom, as we know, not true. Um, but the fact that she's cropping up in these sort of prints as a, without really any explanation, shows how well known she was as a name and sort of really how big this business was. Um, and so you get this, this sort of really, um, really sort of significant wholesale and, and direct business in gut condoms throughout the 18th century and into the 19th century. Um, given how labour intensive it is, they were expensive. So they weren't accessible to working class people, but they were, you do see them a lot at sort of middle and upper classes, and particularly the upper classes who are keeping their diaries and writing about their sexual habits. What actually makes them more accessible uh, is a series of improvements in the 19th century in rubber processes and the manufacture of rubber. And in 1843, 1844, um, you get the invention of vulcanized rubber. Um, so this basically means that rubber is easy to work with during the manufacturing process. Um, you get the first rubber condoms invented in 1850 thereabouts. Now, initially, they're incredibly effective, uh, but they are very, very thick, and they essentially have to be made to measure, which strikes me as a deeply embarrassing doctor's appointment. Uh, but they, they improve quite rapidly, sort of in those first 30, 40 years of their use. Uh, and they are, whereas animal gut condoms are quite effective at preventing pregnancy, um, Surprisingly so, they are absolutely rubbish at preventing the spread of venereal disease. These new rubber condoms are very, they may be thick and a bit unwieldy and quite tricky to lay your hands on initially, but they are very, very effective. 
you get the first mass-produced condoms um, in the US. The US are quite sort of leading in their rubber condoms uh, in the 1850s, but we don't get the first real mass production. We think the first company to do it was this one, um, which is Lambert's of Dalston, who seemed to start turning them out around 1877. Uh, and initially they are made by taking, when, when we move into mass production, um, Initially, they're made by taking a flat piece of ribbon, uh, rubber and seaming it down one side. So you get this seamed condom in a number of different sizes. Um, and from about the 1890s, we know that Lambert's are turning out about 720,000 condoms a year in this style. Now, this is a fabulous uh, directory um, uh, catalogue um, from Lambert's from 1900. Um, and around that sort of 1890s, we get a few real sort of changes um, in the way that condoms are made. So we get uh, the development of cement dipping, which basically means you can take your condom shaped mold and you can dip it in rubber repeatedly to build up layers. And um, so you are moving away from your seamed condoms and uh, into your seamless condoms. The other thing that happens is we get the addition of the condom teat around this period, which is still considered quite new by 1900. Uh, and fascinatingly, this catalogue includes all sorts of different medical products, but it has a whole section on different kinds of condoms listed as sheaths here. Now, these different kinds, the Ideal, the Malthus, the Paragon, are basically just brand names. They're all slightly different styles. Um, maybe brand names is not the right. Different styles and different ways that they're presented. But look at the bottom there. They're still selling skin condoms and skin condoms continue to be produced um, I mean, you can still buy them, but they continue to be produced and used pretty regularly well into the uh, 20th century, partly because it takes a long time for rubber, despite being cheaper and easier, to catch up with the thinness of skin. Uh, and so you do find them being sold alongside rubber condoms in this way. And here's an example of one of those. Um, so this one has a teat. It's called The Ideal, uh, invented in 1898, but there it is in the 1900s catalog. Uh, and um, this one, this is another invention that comes in at this period. They start selling them rolled. Um, and not all condoms are sold like this, um, but, uh, and you do have to have a special device to re-roll them um, because these are still reusable. All of these condoms that we have talked about this far are reusable. The idea is that your animal gut condom, you will rinse it out after use, you will dry it back up, and then when you want to do it, you rehydrate it again. Um, and that idea comes into the early rubber condoms. Um, they are produced and it's considered that you can use them a number of times. Um, and if you're interested in this catalogue and the sort of different condoms that are on sale around this period, um, one of the things that is in the little exhibition out there are catalogues which list some of these similar um, condoms in them. They're for a little bit later in 1914, um, but worth a look. Um, and this is uh, the, the Paragon condom. Um, this is a seamless condom, but has not been rolled. It's produced and, and sold flat like this. Uh, and there are a number of these sort of styles. This is actually quite late. This is uh, 1940s, um, and it really has been superseded by better technology, but again, still being produced, and you get that a lot. You get these older styles and older fabrics and older um, sort of materials continuing to be produced, even though they've been superseded by new ones. Uh, and of course, the next big change in condoms is the invention of latex in the 1920s. Now, England, well, the UK as a whole, is actually pretty slow in picking up latex technology. And again, the US is at the forefront of rubber condoms. Uh, so with the invention of latex, um, they start to mass produce latex condoms. Now, latex condoms are thinner um, and they are much easier to roll. Um, they're much, much cheaper to produce. So essentially, the invention of latex is the point that condoms become disposable. It's the point that you stop reusing your condoms. Um, and also they're much more discreet because they can be sold in much smaller packets. It's not those big long boxes that you're selling them in. It's things much more like this. These are sort of 1930s, 1940s latex condoms. Uh, now, the US starts mass producing these in the 1920s. And actually the first latex condoms that come into the UK are imported from the US. They're called the Dreadnought. Uh, I don't know, <laughs> a lot of questions. Um, but they were first mass produced uh, in the UK in 1932. 
um, and that was by British Latex Products, who are a sister company of the London Rubber Company, who become the biggest producer of condoms in the 20th century. Um, and they go on throughout the 50s and 60s to make huge numbers of condoms. Uh, and then just on the right here, um, as condoms become smaller and easier and cheaper and more available to people, um, they come up with new ways of marketing them as well. And one of the things they do in the 1930s is they produce all of these condom tins and start selling them in really pretty packaging. Um, and there's loads of amazing examples um, of these, and these are just a couple. Now, up until this point, condoms have been something that you can go and find if you want. But there has been no campaign really to encourage people to use them. Um, and the first one of those you get is in the First World War. Um, and this happens throughout the First World War and the Second World War. Um, and essentially with servicemen going around the world, um, there is a huge rise in venereal disease. Uh, and it becomes a real issue for armies. Um, and Germany, actually, in the First World War, is very swift off the mark, and they just start issuing all of their um, soldiers with condoms. The US and Britain hold back for moral reasons. Um, the, uh, the British start issuing them in 1917 in the First World War. Um, by that point, um, they have lost... Um, up until that point, they start issuing them. Um, it's estimated that about 5% of the fighting force was incapacitated at any one time because of venereal disease. Um, and they've done some estimations around the US forces, and they think they lost nearly 7 million working days to them. So you can see why towards the end of the war, they were quite keen to suddenly start campaigning for the use of condoms. Um, and they learned the lesson with the First World War, and they were quite active in um, their campaigns for contraception, and particularly for condoms in the Second World War. Um, the US were probably better at it than the UK. These are both US examples. Um, I absolutely love this one on the right. Like, the more you look at it, the better it gets. Uh, I take one everywhere, I take my penis. Uh, but my favourite bit is just down the bottom here. Um, which uh, this is a graph, the pleasure graph. So um, this is sex without a condom, slightly more pleasure than sex with a condom, but lots more pleasure than treating genital warts. Uh, it's, it's just a fabulous piece of design. Um, so you do get these sort of sustained campaigns, particularly in times of war, that start advocating for condoms. Um, and then it sort of peters out for a bit, and obviously... The next big one that you get is around the AIDS epidemic in the 1980s and 1990s. And these are just a couple of examples um, from the Wellcome Institute that has an enormous collection of posters from that period and pamphlets from that period. Now, I sort of wanted to bring the story of condoms up to date. And I was like, OK, what are the, what are the new innovations in condoms? Where are we going? What's the future hold for condoms? And the answer is not a lot at the moment. Uh, so, obviously, there have been innovations in condoms in the 20th century. We've got the addition of, you know, flavoured condoms and different styles of condoms that have come in. Um, but in terms of sort of great deal of change, there hasn't been much. Um, and actually, Bill Gates tried to do something about that in 2013. And he put out a competition to innovate in condoms. Uh, and he funded, I think we had about 812 entries, and he funded 11 of those. So that was nearly 10 years ago now. Um, and he gave them quite a lot of money. Some of those are still running. Um, most of them are focusing on making condoms thinner, on making them stronger, uh, and on making them self-lubricating. So they all have slightly different angles on that. Um, but none of those things he funded, none of those groups um, have got anywhere near commercial production yet. Um, so maybe watch this space. There maybe are sort of innovations and changes to come. Um, but there's nothing imminently hitting the market.